All right, boys and girls, this week we're going to be continuing kind of where we left off last week. We're going to be checking our diff carrier to make sure that it is not cracked for the rear end for my pickup truck. We're going to do a Magnaflux test on it. We're also going to do a wet check or a dye check on it just to check for cracks and make sure that the case is indeed you know, still good. We've also got some exciting news in regards to the Dual milling machine that I'll share with you along with some new equipment to add to the shop. So, exciting week. And thanks for watching. Sorry for the late video. I was dealing with some software issues. So we got our diff carrier all stripped down. I'm going to clean the oil off of it, do a quick crack check on it. We'll also check for run out because it could have got bent as well with the dance that it did with those gear teeth in that housing, those broken gear teeth. And if either one of those are the case, it's cracked, even a hair crack, or bent, this thing's going to the scrap pile because uh, I'm not going to be trying to find a, another carrier to put these components in because you're talking a lot of money to fix this thing and you could easily buy an aftermarket proven off-road differential for the cost of just the repair components for this thing. So that's the deal. Also, if our components for our, our, our friction components are wore past their specifications, I'm not going to fix this thing either. But they look good, and I do have the factory specifications to mic all this stuff out and check it. I'll do that, but hopefully that makes sense. If there's one thing that I, that's wrong with us, it's not going to be repaired. But we're going to give it a we're going to give it a shot. Come on. So before I check this thing for cracks, I want to get the bearings off because I want to look around the base of the uh, bearing as well. So we got our puller on here. Hopefully it will hold and not, not bend. Who knows? So let's see if we can't try to pull this bearing off. If we can't, we'll just cut it with the cutoff wheel. Chances are, because these are so far apart, it's just going to bend these rods, that'd be my guess. Not gonna work. So these little small non-reinforced cutoff wheels, they don't last very long, but man, they're great for stuff like this. You know, they don't, uh, the cut time's fast on them. They're not very strong. You can uh, easily break one, but what the heck's going on? They do shatter on occasion. I 
think that's about got it. Sometimes it's kind of hard to judge, but you know, just do the best you can do. Try not to cut into the actual housing too much. So here's where these large vices come in handy. Obviously all I'm trying to do with the cutoff wheel is just weaken that race enough, not cut all the way through it, but just cut through it enough to where it's weak and then I can you know, hit it in the slot that I cut and it breaks along that slot and then I can get it off easily. a chunk off of that chisel and it's stuck in my hand. good on that one so it didn't cut into that at all this one so there's something about chisels that I've always liked and I always pick them up if I see them at a yard sale or flea market or something where they're cheap and if you're needing some small chisels I'll usually make them out of quality allen wrenches I've got a bunch of them that are just shop made. They hold up really well. It's a good material for them. You know, impact resistant and they're hexagonal so they don't roll off your bench. So the disc carrier is completely stripped down. Check out that hole right there. Now that's not from damage. There's another one on this hole. They just or on this side. They just machine these carriers so thin. You'd think that they would have removed these burrs and stuff, because all that's going to do is break out and get inside of the bearings and stuff. Kind of a bad move from this diff manufacturer. This diff is screaming, don't use me. So I don't know how well you can see that, but there's a line there that runs about halfway around uh, the bearing seat on this uh, carrier. Now, what that tells me is that at one point somebody's put a bearing on this, a carrier bearing, and they got it on crooked. You can see, hopefully, that it stops right there, and it's halfway. So the bearing got cocked on there. It wouldn't go on. Maybe they lined it up a little better and got it pushed on there. But that either happened at the factory or somebody's been in here and uh, put bearings in this thing. So I don't like that. I'm going to have to stone that down. So if you're interested in getting into repair, I would argue that right now is the best time in history we've ever had for the tradespeople, DIY guys and gals, because the ease of access of information is just amazing to me. There's rarely a question that I have that somebody hasn't already asked on a forum or on video, and somebody was nice enough to answer it. So it's such a nice thing. I remember back before the internet, if you had a question, you would ask your dad, your mom, yeah. The guy down at the dealership who you would hope would give you the answer, but maybe he wouldn't because he was protecting his information in his trade. Or you'd go to the library and hope they had a book on the topic that you were interested in. But that's just not the case now. Most things you can do a quick search on and the answer will pop right up in your face. The problem is knowing the right questions to ask, I guess. But repair is an awesome thing. If you're interested, get into it. Not only does it save the planet, I guess, in a way, but uh, it's also pretty fulfilling to fix something that was considered garbage, right? 
So here's what I believe is going to be my setup to check the run out on the face of this diff carrier. We're just sitting on the bearing races, or not the races, but the bearing seats of the carrier in a couple of V blocks jacked up with a couple one, two, three blocks backed up by a angle here just to give this whole setup a little more rigidity. Tense indicator on the face of this diff carrier flange. I'm just going to zero it out. So I guess right about there on the flange of this is going to be good enough. And this is a tense indicator, so you know, a lot of movement does not necessarily equal a lot of run out. So I'm just going to turn this thing without trying to influence it too much. Uh, one and a half thou. We bounced to two, but it was just a sporadic bounce. I'm looking for a continuous wave, really. Not looking for individual humps and bumps, to be honest. That's two and a half thou. So it looks like I got a max reading of about two and a half thousandths. I think that's probably okay. I'll check the specs, make sure, but two and a half thousandths on something like this does not seem uh, to be too far out in my opinion, but I'll check. I don't think that's bad. So I'm all set up to do my magnetic particle inspection on this in-question diff carrier. And the idea behind this test is that we're going to use this unit to induce a magnetic field in this while we sprinkle some iron powder on it. And the idea is that if there is a crack in this thing, the inner, it will interrupt that magnetic field, the flow of that field along that crack, and this powder should line up and make that crack visible. So that's the idea. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of this test. It works, but there are instances where it may not show depending on the way that you test. So I'm going to also do a wet dye penetrant test on this thing as well because I want to be able to sleep at night. And uh, man, if I missed a crack in this, I would be very upset with myself. So I've had this Magnaflux crack checking set up for quite some time, although I don't think that I've ever showed it on the channel. And I picked it up at a flea market, paid a very reasonable price for it. I was surprised to find it. It came with red powder, gray powder, white powder, and black powder, all used, I guess, for different color surfaces to check. It's pretty neat. So there are a couple tricks to using this thing. I, what I do is go around it holding the magnet, in one orientation, then I rotate that magnet 90 degrees and go over that same surface again. That way, if there is a crack that runs directly in line with the way that you're holding you know, the wand or the, the magnet, uh, you'll catch it where otherwise uh, it may not show up. So, you know, this test is fine and it it's very effective, but I do like the wet dye test a little better. So no cracks on the face of this thing, which is a good thing. So I'm going to check the sides now. And I'll check the back as well, just to be sure. When I got this tester, the legs on it, it hadn't been used in so long that they were rusted solid. You can see that you can adjust them to fit the part that you're using. They're really just laminates. A little bunch of little... Uh, plates of steel, but it took me a while to get it broke free and cleaned up. I don't see any cracks, not in this area anyway. I'm going to check the face. Mm -hmm. 
So no cracks detected with this method anyway. So I'm ready for the die check process and I'm going to do this face first and I've showed this on my channel before but I'll quickly explain it. So we've cleaned the part, we're going to spray a penetrant on there, just a red dye. It will soak into any imperfections or cracks that this may have. We'll wipe that off. It will stay in those cracks if it has them. And then we'll spray a developer on here and it if it does have cracks and this stuff is soaked into it, that developer will pull it up out of that crack and make a visible line along that break or whatever uh, imperfections it may have. So it just highlights imperfections that you wouldn't be able to see by eye. Let that sit for a minute. I'll wipe all that off and then we'll spray the developer on there, see if there's any cracks in that base. So this is definitely my favorite, um, you know, kind of DIY crack check method. I think it's, I don't know, I don't want to say more accurate, maybe a little more user friendly than uh, less room for error than the uh, MPI. With the, but I would like one of those tanks where you can use the, uh, what is it, the ultraviolet, or the UV lamp. All right, so I sprayed it with the developer, just like I painted it on there. You can see that it has a pink tint to it because I did not wipe this down with a cleaner after I was done. But if it had any cracks in it, they would show up as bright red lines, in my experience anyway. So, looks good. I don't see any cracks uh, on the face of this. So the good thing about this test is that the components to do it are really cheap. The die, penetrant, and developer it all comes in a kit. You know, follow the directions. You can do it at home. Any parts that you suspect may be cracked, you know, no reason to take them to the machine shop and no reason to guess and, uh, you know, hope you made the right decision on, uh, on a part that's as critical as something like this, a diff carrier. Because if this thing fails, everything fails in the rear end. 78 Corolla in 1981, I bought it. And I was 20 years old. And I beat the living snot. I mean, it was just, I was merciless for that thing. Oh, it's 
Let's grab our drink. Let's see. <laughs> Go on. Come on. Come on. Come here, man. Be quiet. Go on. Go on. Go on. Uh -huh. <laughs> She's like, don't touch me. Her eyes are all big, like. You did it. I can't believe you. Yeah. Getting heavy? Let it go. Good. Yep. Good. Okay. It's down. Okay. More thing. I didn't even say that I can find that. Pull this out if you want to kind of lift the, the base. So let me introduce you to my new Strands Do-All Drill Press. This thing's awesome. It has some features on it that the other one does not. In fact, it has a feature on it that I didn't even know that uh, Strands even offered. This one is the power down feed model. I didn't even know it existed until me and Al found this thing at an auction. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things you just kind of have to have. Even though the power down feed on this thing unfortunately doesn't work, we'll have to tear into it and see what the deal is, although I don't expect it to be, uh, you know, anything real major. Hopefully, uh, we'll just have to tear into it to find out. But having power down feed on a drill press like this is, is awesome. So the d major differences, minus the uh, power down feed, between this drill press and the other one is this one has a much wider speed range 
Now, the one against the wall that I've been using goes from 120 RPM up to 1,640. Now, this drill press goes from 85 RPM all the way up to 3,530 RPM. So that's pretty impressive for an older drill press to run that quick, uh, of this size anyway. So it should have no problem running the smaller bits more efficient than what you could do on that other machine. Now, this one also has an extra deep throat on it. I think it's about four inches deeper the, than the one against the wall, so you can do larger pieces on this. It also has a five inch column where the one against the wall has a four inch column. It also has a longer foot on it because it has a deeper throat and more of the weights out front. It needs a longer foot on it, which is not in frame, but it needs a longer foot on it so it can be stable. Now the table on this thing is also in extremely good shape, which is you know, another rarity when it comes to these machines. So four speeds uh, when it comes to selection of the down feed rate and pretty much everything else is the same, right? So I'm excited to have this thing and can't wait to get it up and going because it's gonna be as good as I can imagine a drill press could be for the home shop anyway. It's nice. So just so you know that I'm not filling you full of beans, we'll do a quick little, uh, little check here 23 and a half inches long on the foot of that machine and from the front of the column to the center of the drill chuck is 10 inches and the tables on these machines are exactly the same size the work table now the foot of this machine is much larger it is 28 and a half inches so that is was that's five inches yeah five inches longer on the foot and from the face of the column here to the center of the drill chuck that is one foot and a half inch. So that is two and a half inches deeper, you know, bigger work envelope. This machine having the bigger column, longer foot, you could put heavier work on the table. It also has a heavier bracket that holds the table. So there are multiple differences, although they somewhat look identical, they are not. So this is just a, they're both awesome, but this is just a little more capable than, than the other one there. Not electrocuted, that's positive. Oh, so, <clears throat> someone uh, pushed a button. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mind if we did that? Uh, that I don't go. know. No, well, hopefully it works now. Yes. So I have some extremely exciting news that I want to share with you in regards to the big dual milling machine that a lot of you guys may remember me getting and then we discovered that the ways on the knee were really scorn and damaged. So we tore that milling machine down, cleaned all the parts up. My buddy Al took my table and the knee up to Cash Masters in Wisconsin at Kinetics uh, and Cash was nice enough to, to grind these for me. And he has also done work for Lance Baltzy, Keith Rucker, and some other guys you may know. He's Knife Maker Kinetic on Instagram. Great guy. I really enjoyed doing business with him. And he done a phenomenal job on these, and I can't wait to get this machine back together. Um, he also found some error that was in this table from the factory. You know, we ground the top, we ground the bottom, but in the dovetail ways on the bottom of this table, there was eight thousandths of error from one end to the other that was in this thing from the factory that Cash corrected. So I'm glad that I sent the table, and I'm glad that I, I'm glad that he was willing to do the legwork and check this thing before he just you know ground it in and kept the error. So thank you, Cash. I appreciate it. And if you need anything ground, I really suggest that you give Cash a call. See if he'd be interested in helping you out. I know that he can do stuff on a scale that a lot of people can't. So 
Definitely appreciate it. Let me show you the work that he done and you'll see, you know, it's top notch stuff. So check out how nice the finish is on the top of this table. I am really stoked to get this thing going back together and start using it. It's better than it was the day that it rolled off the factory floor because Cash took the time to make sure that the dovetails were indeed, you know, parallel with the with the uh, T slots and the sides of the table. I didn't check it before I sent it to him. I did send I sent this table because I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't bent or anything. He touched the top up and reground the bottom and like I said, took the extra time to check it. So thank you, Cash. This thing is now better than it ever was. So that's what kind of guy he is. And uh, if you're interested in having some work done, I highly recommend him if he can fit you in. Um, I don't think you'll be disappointed. Let me show you the knee. We did make some compromises on that, but we talked it over and you'll see what I'm talking about. It's as good as it needs to be. So this thing, before too long, should be an operating, operational milling machine. So this big chunk of iron right here is the reason this mill got tore down, simply because there was so much scoring uh, in this section right here. And if you can see that due to the light, we left some of the scoring in it. And the reason why we did is because, for one, I talked to a lot of people who know what they're talking about, you know, more than I do. And they recommended that, you know, just grind them back flat, leave that in because it's not going to hurt anything. They're actually low. They'll just be extra oil pockets. There's still plenty of bearing surface here. So once this is flaked and put back together with some good way covers and kept clean, this score marks that you see won't hurt a thing. Although it may hurt the resale value of this machine uh, for anybody who really knows what's going on, um, you know, that's just cosmetic. It does hurt my feelings a bit, but that's it. It doesn't hurt the operation of this machine. And, uh, you know, other than grind away so much material uh, just for cosmetic reasons, we chose to leave these marks in and it'll just make fitting this thing back together much easier. And, you know, we just remove less, uh, less cast iron that way. So left some score marks in, but that's just the way it goes. Everything is flat and true with each other. So that's the important part. So can't wait to get this thing making chips again. So even though it's gonna be a little while before I get this machine back together, I feel very relieved to have the table and the knee freshly ground and back home again. Um, it's gonna be an awesome machine. 30 taper spindle, huge table and knee. There's a, just a, a massive amount of cast iron in that machine. And with a DRO on it, possibly in the future, it should be a accurate and rigid piece of equipment. And I can't wait to make some chips with it. So, I also want to say thanks to my buddy Al because he took the time out of his busy day to pick these parts up from here. He took them his, on his way, but he still took all the effort to load these on his trailer, take them to Kinetics, drop them off, you know, talk to Cash and relay my, some of my information. And then when they were done, he picked them by, back up and brought them to me. So thank you, Al. You are awesome. And that's no secret. All my viewers uh, have seen Al before and know he's quite a awesome dude so thank you very much i appreciate it and i really look forward to making some chips with this machine So I knocked the pinion races out of that rear end housing because we won't be using these in the new setup. There's our back bearing and our front bearing that uh, this pinion rolls on. And the preload in between these two bearings is really critical that it be set proper. You don't want it to be too tight and cause accelerated wear on these bearings, but you don't want it to be so loose that 
stuff moves and makes noise and accelerated wear or breaks teeth or whatever. And that preload is determined by how tight you tighten this nut and how far you crush this sleeve, which the tighter you tighten a nut, the thinner the sleeve gets. And you gotta be really careful. These are a one-time use deal, so you don't wanna go over tight. But what I need to do here, because all this stuff is really junk, other than there's a shim, or should be a shim in between this bearing and the face of this gear. And I need to get that shim out of there because that will be a good place to start when we go back and start reassembling the rear end. Because the gear set that I get will be probably, if not exactly, very closely machined to the same tolerances that this gear set is, and that shim you know, will be a good place to start. So I need to remove this bearing in order to determine the thickness of that shim. about 38 thousandths of an inch. So there's the slide hammer block that I made up. Just a pivot block so I can slide it into this bearing. And then it falls flat and I can slide hammer the bearings out. And it's amazing to think that, you know, if you've got a half ton pickup, that everything you've ever put in the bed of it's been held up by two bearings, probably very similar to, to, to the size of these. The, the load bearing, uh, capabilities of a bearing this size will blow you away. But it doesn't look like enough, but they work pretty well. So in closing, if you would, bear with me for a moment while I try to explain my situation that I'm in with these rear axles. And I'll try to keep this short, but I'm not making any promises. So a lot of you know, a couple weeks ago when I got these axles, my plans were pretty simple. What I was going to do is do a quick oil change on them, change the brakes, any little things that they needed, you know, just freshen them up and then put them under the truck and use them. And obviously that hasn't worked out. Uh, come to find out this rear axle was completely obliterated on the inside and very few things in there were good or, you know, things that I would trust to reuse. So here we are. And, uh, you know, at the time when I found out that this axle was bad, I was pretty bummed about it because I knew that I was going to have to buy a gear set and, you know, go through all the process of the setup and, uh, you know, I've, to say the least, I was bummed. But now, hindsight being 2020, I really think it's the best thing that could have happened. It may be weird to say, but I really do believe that that was a, a good thing. Why, you ask? Because it's given me lots of time, lots of time to think in regard, think about what these axles, what do they need to be in order to serve me the best? So I've been on forums nonstop. I've been cramming knowledge on you know, gear ratios and setups nonstop like a college student before final exams and uh, talking to manufacturers of off-road components and everybody's telling me the same thing. The consensus is pretty clear. They're saying, Steve, you probably won't like that 308 ratio. And after looking at the numbers, I pretty much agree. It would kill the low-end performance of that truck, which is where I use it the most in the muddy fields, sometimes at walking speed, throwing wood in the back. You, know, you pretty much kiss that goodbye to a certain extent if I had put these under the truck as they were. 
So, what I've decided to do is change up, turn around, change gears on this, literally and figuratively, to 373, which is what's under the truck right now. And, uh, you know, because I know that that ratio works for me. I'm all, both front and back axles obviously going to have to be changed because it is a four-wheel drive. Now, some of you will say, just don't use those axles at all. You know, I could easily go to a government auction, buy a used set of MRAP axles, military axles, four-link suspension that truck, and put some huge mud tires on it. I don't want to do that. That would absolutely, it would be cool, that's for sure. But it would absolutely kill the performance of that truck as far as for my uses. It would be heavy, it would be expensive, it would be labor intensive to do, and you know, it wouldn't be what I want. I wanna keep the factory look of that truck. I like these axles, they're light, and uh, they've always served me well. I've never broken an, you know, a, an axle housing on one of these, and I've done a lot of, I don't wanna say stupid stuff, that doesn't sound good, not so smart stuff uh, with my trucks over the years. I've had a lot of these sets of axles and I've never, never broken one. <laughs> so my plan is, uh, in a nutshell, is to change the gear ratios on these and beef these up to a point to where I'm happy, uh, you know, that they're not gonna break on me. I'm not gonna use that G80 diff, but at the advice of a lot of people, uh, because of what it's been through for one and for two, it just doesn't have the best, uh, the best reputation off-road. I will put this uh, differential under the old axles that's in the truck for a backup, but as far as under, the, under this new build, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> uh, there was this people I know and that said, well, I don't know personally, people that in the comment section said, throw opinion in it, put it just, put it back together, make it work. It's simply a farm truck. And part of me agrees with that. Yeah, it is, it is a farm truck at the moment. But the machinist part of me says no way. Because I've been around long enough to have seen many, taken part in and seen many gear setups done, rear axles. Uh, I've seen people put them gear setups in barns in the dark with total disregard to any torque specifications, backlash, bearing preload, just put it in there, does it fit? Yeah, tighten it up and done, and they last 10 years. And then, <laughs> trouble free. Uh, and I've seen people put them in, you know, do the same thing, and they last two weeks, and I don't want to be in that situation. They shed metal the whole time that you're using them and destroy all the components that you just put in new, and it cost you all that money and all that time for nothing. When you could have avoided, at least your chances are much better to, of avoiding that if you go through the specifications and just do it try to do it to the best of your ability the first time. I don't claim to be Mr. Axel, but uh, I know that just throwing a gear set in is not a good idea. So don't listen to those people, please. Anyway, hopefully that made sense. I'm gonna turn around, I'm gonna change gears, literally and figuratively, on these axles and uh, beef them up a bit. I'm not gonna go ex too extreme on it, but I'm gonna put good quality components in these because I've got uh, an opportunity and I think uh, it's just the best thing to do for the long-term uh, performance of this setup. So there you go. That's my thoughts, and that's where I'm at. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for this uh, uh, blown-up axle. So th thanks for watching. Thanks to my viewers, patrons, and subscribers, anybody who's uh, supported me in my adventures. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Hopefully that made sense. I will see you next time.